left on the dock for more than 24 hours will be compressed to a cube at the owner's expense. Welcome to Sacred Cow Shipyards. It has come to my attention that this weekend is the release weekend for the sequel to the highest grossing movie in human history. Technically, it's the second highest grossing movie in human history if you adjust for your government's destroying your currency by way of inflation, but still, it's first or second on either chart. Now, I want to ask you a question. And I don't want you to cheat by Googling and doing all those other things you do to cheat. Take a moment, think about it, and from memory, quote a single line of more than, say, five to ten words from the movie Avatar. Go ahead, give it a shot. We'll be here when you get back. Because, you see, Avatar, to me, is a fascinating movie, but not for the reasons you might think. Instead, it was, in fact, a visual spectacle. It was redonkulously expensive to produce. It has made obscene quantities of money. And yet it is perfectly unmemorable. Oh, sure, oh, sure, oh, sure. You remember the floating jungles and the blue giants and their weird way of interfacing with their local flora and fauna and the mechs and the helicopters and the flying transport ships and this, that, and the other. But that's all part of the visual spectacle of the movie. The movie itself, the story, well, the story is just a ripoff of Fern Gully, Pocahontas, and a few other decidedly not science fiction movies. In fact, it's frankly fascinating that your current culture, as sensitive as it is to these kinds of things, hasn't lost their mind over all of the Native American implications um, embedded into the uh, Avatar movie. But still... For that exact reason, if nothing else, the story is completely forgettable. It's prosaic. It's predictable. It's been done before. And the individual lines, the script that is, didn't actually bring anything new to the stage. I mean, the motion capturing facial expression rig they used to allow the, the Pandorans to have humanoid expressions was revolutionary at the time, sure. And watching Stephen Lang literally chew on the scenery was also a good time, as it always is. But there's still nothing there. As a wise playboy from your planet once wrote long ago, it was full of sound and fury, and signifying nothing. Now, what's interesting is that it was not a tale told by an idiot. So I guess it diverges from the quote a little bit. You see, uh, the, uh, the man behind Avatar, a certain sophant by the name of James Cameron, is apparently a closet nerd. Actually, not very closeted. Because, you see, he wrote a 10-page dissertation, thesis, instruction manual on the topic of today's episode. And that is the Interstellar Vehicle Venture Star. And no, I'm not even making that up. Literally 10 pages long. The, the, the artist actually owns up to this. And it was on the, the movie for what? 10 minutes, maybe? Max? And most of that was like inside shots? Seriously. This, this, this was a big deal to Mr. Jim. So what was all of that background information that didn't make it into the movie? And does it make a lick of sense? Well, well, honestly, eh, I guess we'll see. So for those of y'all who have not seen this visual masterpiece or simply do not remember it due to its unremarkable nature, the ISV Venture Star does a... Uh, What's a triangle trade without one point in the triangle? I guess it just does a loop between Earth and Pandora, which is a moon orbiting Polyphemus, which is a planet in the Alpha Centauri system, which is a complicated problem to begin with, since Alpha Centauri is a trinary star system. Orbital mechanics are totally whack there. 
Any ways you discovered slash will discover this moon sometime in the 2050 to 2077 range, according to your calendar, and then you sent a massive freaking honker of a ship out there to go and see what was going on. Looked interesting. Seemed to support life and had liquid water and met all your other requirements for being an interesting place to go and explore. Now, this initial ship you sent out was so massive because it had to use supercooled, superconducting materials to contain the matter-antimatter reaction drive that it used. Now, before you get all, like, warm in your pants or whatever about that particular phrase, no, it was not a warp drive. It is literally a brute force annihilation drive. It feeds in antimatter and matter simultaneously. They annihilate each other, produce redonkulous amounts of energy. So you feed in a little more hydrogen, which of course automatically turns into plasma when exposed to that energy and escapes out of the exhaust jets at the stern of the ship, thereby giving propulsion. It's totally not warp drive. It is strictly slower than light. There is no FTL in the Avatar universe yet, I guess. I haven't actually seen the uh, sequel at the time of this recording, so who knows what's next? So anyways, this ship eventually got to Pandora and discovered basically the hinge pin of the entire Avatar movie. And that is to say a certain metal totally imaginatively named Unobtainium. <sighs> Conveniently, Unobtainium is a room temperature superconductor, which allowed future generations of interstellar ships to be much smaller and much lighter which leads us to the entire ISV class. Because you see, the Venture Star is one of 12. And this makes sense when you realize that the trip from Earth to Pandora, or vice versa, takes about 6.75. And this is where things get a little weird, because of course that guy with the crazy hair. Well, technically he was a guy on your planet to first notice relativity, but that's a separate conversation. Anyways, um, so the entire ISV class, like I said, it takes about seven years to make the 4.37 light year trip from Earth to Pandora or back again. So basically, you have like this wagon train through the stars. Hey, where have I heard that reference before? Traveling from Earth to Pandora and from Pandora back again. And basically, each ISV spends about a year orbiting Pandora, unloading and then reloading, and then it starts the trip back again and joins the wagon train to the stars again. And this has been going on for about 77 ish years in the case of the ISV Venture Star specifically. So that's the first thing that was kind of omitted. There's a lot of these things, and they're very, very busy. The second big thing that was kind of left out of this whole equation is that when the ships are leaving uh, the solar system, your solar system, the solar, Terran solar system, whatever you want to call it, they are actually propelled by a photon sail. Now, it's important to note that I did say photon sail, not solar sail. What's the difference? Apparently, at some point in your mm, upcoming future or recent past, depending on which kind of tense you want to take on this conversation, you will or have or whatever have discovered a solid state molecular laser that is not probably on Earth itself, as your documentation would seem to indicate. It's probably on a Lagrange point or somewhere else in the solar system, and it just pumps massive quantities of photons at this redonkulously huge sail that the ISVs use to leave the solar system. In fact, that sail is only just a few bare molecules thick, but it is 16 kilometers in diameter. In fact, they have to spin the whole vehicle, sail included, to make the sail rigid. Because if you just, like, tried to throw the sail out there and didn't spin it, it would probably collapse in on itself. But instead, they spin the entire interstellar vehicle, sail included, and catch a ride on this massive honking laser. Coincidentally, this is also how the ISVs decelerate into your solar system. As they are approaching your solar system, the laser draws a bead on them and zaps them with all the photons and the sail slows them down again now from looking at the isv venture star as it orbits uh, the pandora or whatever that moon is called would you have known that of course not oh my god of course not oh my dear lord of course not because the real kicker the joke of this entire vehicle 
is that the sail, like I said, was just a few bare molecules thick. It collapses onto that boom, that little tiny narrow ass boom. You see sticking itself forward between those two massive glowing elements. Yeah, that little tiny boom projects out a 16 kilometer diameter photon sail and then automatically collapses it again so it can be recycled and used again. Because actually, I don't know if they have a fail safe program for if the sail can't deploy, how do we stop this super luminal? Uh, well, mm, it's not technically super luminal, is it? Yeah. You see, for somehow, and this explains my yeah noise, um, apparently a laser, just a laser, just a massive honking laser, but still just a laser, is sufficient to achieve 1.5 Gs of acceleration out of the solar system. Now, for those of y'all who don't know what a G might mean, because who knows, humans might not be the only audience for this particular weird-ass corner of YouTube. Regardless, a G for Humies is 9.81-ish meters per second squared. So basically, this laser was whacking that 16 kilometer diameter sail hard enough to generate 1.5 G's of acceleration for as long as it took to get to approximately 0.7 times the speed of light. Now, fine, this is all good and well for leaving and entering the Terran solar system. What about Alpha Centauri? They got a laser too? Amusingly, no. They've been making this run for 77 years, and they never bothered to build a laser out there. Who knows why? In reality, those big-ass glowing plates that I referenced earlier are actually, wait for it, the heat sinks. <laughs> for the matter-antimatter drive that actually can propel the ISV on its own. Shockingly, the ISV is what's called a tractor configuration. The engines are at the front. In fact, the engines, the fuel tank, the matter-antimatter tank, all of that crap is all up at the front of the vehicle. And those two jet-looking things coming off the front of the vehicle are, in fact, jets that are slightly angled out and shoot out the plasma stream that is produced from the matter-antimatter reaction. And then those massive plates are, yes, the heat sinks necessary to cool this entire process off. Apparently, once it achieves orbit around Pandora, those plates can take months to cool off, which, as we talked about previously, makes a whole lot of sense, because the only way to get rid of heat in space is either by dumping mass, hot mass preferably, or radiation, and radiation takes time. So yeah, look at that! Somebody actually thought about heat disposal in space! How wild is that?! Now, the only reason that ISVs are, frankly, as small as they are is because they were able to exploit these room temperature superconducting material that is unobtainium from uh, Pandora. As I mentioned previously, the first ship out to the Alpha Centauri system was fucking enormous, even by my standards, because it didn't have room temperature superconductors. So they had to cool those down in order to contain the matter-antimatter reaction that propelled the ship the entire distance. Apparently, they didn't have the laser then either. Now, now they have superconductors that work perfectly fine, basically perfectly efficient. Now the only problem is getting that heat out into the vacuum of space, and as we all know, as I keep saying it over and over and over again, radiation takes time. But if your ship is orbiting a planet for a year, and it takes six months for your heat exchangers to cool down, no big deal, right? But anyways, I know what you're thinking right about now. Wait a second. The front end of the ship is the propulsion end. And all of that massive amount of mass right there is the propulsion system. Where's like the cargo and humies and crap? Amusingly, they occupy those little tiny pods towards the stern of the ship. That's it. In fact, the ISVs only carry about 350 tons of cargo in either direction. Again, that's it. Now, to put that in a perspective your tiny humi brains could understand, you currently on your planet today have these vessels called intracoastal freighters. Basically, they go up and down a seaboard carrying stuff up and down the seaboard. They can normally carry somewhere in the neighborhood of 15,000 to 35,000 tons of cargo. Thousands of tons of cargo. 
the ISVs can carry 350 tons. Tops. And over the course of their 77-year lifespan, no one's figured out a better solution yet. The f***, man. Now, in this particular case, it's kind of a, a chicken-egg, wagon-horse problem. Your Humi settlement on Pandora was basically set up with local materials and a 3D printer that printed more copies of itself. And then those copies built a really redonkulously big 3D printer and it made more copies of itself. And then it made an absolutely obscene 3D printer and it prints out everything they need again out of local materials. So a lot of the cargo that the ISVs are carrying from Earth to Pandora are either specialized materials or data for better printed things. And, I mean, data doesn't exactly weigh very much, so they can get away with a limited cargo capacity. And, I mean, of course, on the way back, the unobtainium, the price for that unobtainium was $20 million per unrefined kilogram. So even if we were talking about metric tons as opposed to put a human on the moon tons, we're still looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of $7 trillion per run. And that's unrefined. Apparently its price doubles once you refine it on Earth. So you've got 12 ISVs and one of them hits Earth every year, give or take a little bit of Delta. And every one of those carries enough cargo to turn eventually into 14 trillion dollars this is not a small undertaking is it of course i'm not even going to speculate on the economic impact of your humi economy having 14 trillion dollars dropped into it on a yearly basis that's just horrifying but moving on because on top of that 350 tons of raw cargo the isvs also carry somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 passengers now, passengers is a strong word. These passengers are also basically cargo. They are in oversized cryogenic pods that keep them suspended during the entire course of the flight. They are not awake. They are not conscious. They are not doing a goddamn thing. Aside from the passengers, there are also a number of crew. There's some disagreement as to whether or not there were two crew on duty at all times during flight or four crew on duty during all times on flight. But regardless, there was enough crew to have like shifts for either two or four people where either two or four people were awake at all times during the entire course of this flight. Which, again, due to relativistic velocities, took about five years as opposed to the six to almost seven years that it took on Earth, despite Earth not moving. Relativism is hard. But the fun kicker, the real joy of the ISV entire class, is that uh, if something went wrong on the ship, and say the cryo systems failed or whatever, and they were still in transit, they were still getting from Earth to Pandora, or from Pandora back to Earth again, everyone in the cryo system would have been euthanized killed in their sleep because the problem is the isv simply did not have enough food or water or reclamation of the same to keep the entire 200 passenger group alive during the five-ish year flight they had barely enough to keep the crew alive and just the shifts of the crew that were awake during the flights alive so yeah ship broke you died you don't even know you died you were asleep at the time. You were in cryo sleep at the time, and you just never woke up. Damn, son. I mean, it's not like this thing could have escape pods or something. The next ship wasn't going to come by for another year. Good luck with that. Now, the last interesting bit of technology on the ISV class is that mirror-like shield down towards the cargo passenger side of the ship. Apparently, once the ship achieves its... 0.7 C flight speed, it flips over. The entire ship rotates end over end, and that shield is the leading part of the ship as opposed to the engine section that used to be at the front. It also supported the photon sail, remember? Well, that shield is actually multiple layers of shield, and each of those layers have these little thrusters on them that once the ship achieves its intended velocity, those thrusters push the shields out some kilometers farther ahead of the ship than the ship itself. 
so that there, if there is, or when there is, any interstellar debris, that debris hits the first shield, turns into plasma, because of course it's going really, really fast at that point, the debris is, regardless of how fast the debris might be going otherwise, the shield is moving at 0.7c, so a lot of things are moving very fast. So the debris hits the shield, turns into plasma, the next shield deflects that plasma or ablates off its backside as it absorbs the plasma, and the shield behind that catches whatever splatter comes off the second shield. And then there's a the final fourth shield still attached to the vehicle itself. It literally has a multi-layer defense system against interstellar crap, as one has to do when one does not have magi technical deflector shields and nonsense like that. So, does any of this make the slightest bit of sense? It's really hard to say. The whole, like, euthanizing your passengers if their cryo chambers failed, actually, I mean, it's cold-hearted, yeah, pun intended, but no, it makes absolute sense. They, I mean, even if they woke up, they wouldn't have enough supplies to make it to the next stop. So, yeah, you're going to die. Sorry. The tractor aspect of the vehicle, supposedly the materials they used to build the vehicle were cheaper because they only were under tension, not compression, and that made some things easier and almost everything cheaper. I don't know if I believe that or not, but it makes for a distinctive-looking vehicle that everyone misunderstood when the movie came out. So that's always fun. The total cargo capacity on the ISVs, that is to say they're 350 ton, not 350,000, just 350 ton cargo capacity, is absolutely bat insane. The ISVs are 1,646 meters long, 330 meters wide, and 218 meters tall. And you're telling me that this enormous interstellar vehicle can carry a bare 350 tons. A lot of your semi-tractor trailer rigs and just the single rigs, not the double or triple train rigs that a lot of your countries allow, just the single rigs can carry 40 tons by themselves. So this massive honker of an interstellar vehicle that makes the four and a half light year jaunt from Earth to Alpha Centauri can only carry as much as, well, actually as much as less than 10 semi-tractor trailer rigs. 10. Less than 10. What the f***? Now, sure, the materials it carries back are going to be worth 14 trillion dollars on the open market but can we consider what the impact of a yearly influx of 14 trillion dollars worth of material is going to do to your local economy i mean what is going to happen to the dollar in that case given that your governments have already been hell bent on destroying the purchasing value of the dollar even without massively flooding markets with valuable materials and given that just a single launch of your space launch system produced by NASA costs somewhere in the neighborhood of $4.1 billion, well, $14 trillion, I mean, yes, that's over 200 times more money than it costs to do the SLS, but the SLS is only going to the moon. It's not going to Alpha Centauri. And that $4 billion price tag is only the cost of the consumables, not the cost of the research and development and production. Now, the good news is that the ISVs are not themselves consumables. The sale is recoverable. The engines don't really seem to burn out because they're using that unobtainium nonsense. Uh, they reclaim all of their water and oxygen and recycle all of that nonsense and blah, 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 so on and so forth. But the real catch is here that they're antimatter powered. Now, yes, we're all used to Star Trek where the matter or antimatter reaction system in the warp core with the dilithium crystals is like the benchmark of like standard power production in the Star Trek universe, blah, 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 so on and so forth. Except Starfleet is really, really vague on how that antimatter gets produced to begin with. The general hypothesis is that there are these massive, well, actually tiny, 
Dyson spheres, partial Dyson spheres, these massive assemblies around stars, really close up against stars, that gather as much energy as they can from the stars, both by solar radiation and possibly other means, and use that power, that massive quantity of power that sun is just pumping off right next to its surface, to produce antimatter. Fine. All good and well when you have, like, lots and lots of inhospitable, uninhabited solar systems that you can set up these plants at. Except in the Avatar universe, there's Sol and there's Alpha Centauri. And you can't really build massive facilities around either because then you might start affecting the, the, the solar radiation that the adjacent planets are receiving. You might start cutting things off and that might start doing really weird things. So how exactly... Are you making the antimatter to power the ISVs? I mean, yes, technically right now, you are actually making antimatter in redonkulously minuscule quantities, certainly not enough to propel a ship across interstellar distances. And that antimatter you're producing is obscenely expensive. I guess you figured something out. I don't know. Either way, the two best things about the ISV are the fact that the, uh, the crew modules, the, the modules that actually house the crew's cryo chambers and the actual like command and control systems that the crew actually uses are on collapsible rotating modules. So that when the ISV is in orbit around the planets, the modules flip out on their stalks and they spin and they simulate gravity. And when the ISV is under burn at 1.5 G again, the modules flip back down and are in parallel with the rest of the ship so that everything is still oriented in the same direction. The floor is still the floor, except now the floor is 50% closer to you or you're 50% heavier. However you want to look at that particular problem. So at least they thought about how both using spin simulated gravity and acceleration gravity could work out on this particular vehicle. And the second awesome thing we already hit on, of course, is that it has these enormous heat sinks because it would have to matter, antimatter, combustion, annihilation, energy production, however you want to phrase it is hot. As much plasma as you're pumping out of the main drive system of the ISVs, you're producing massive amounts more heat that you just can't figure out what the f*** to do with. So you have radiators. Unobtainium radiators, which apparently work perfectly, aside from the small problem that they're in a vacuum. So they glow forever. Someone actually thought about heat in space, as opposed to someone retconned in f***ing radiators onto a ship that would never actually be able to support radiators, and even if it could support radiators, they would not be nearly effective enough to make a goddamn difference. It's always nice when you guys think ahead occasionally. And that's all from Sacred Cow Shipyards. Please be advised that any ship left on the dock for more than 24 hours will be compressed to a cube at the owner's expense. Have a nice day.